you know, the rabbis, the rabbis taught that some of the scribes, and I suppose it's okay to, to say that, they, they taught that Daniel 7 is considered one of the greatest chapters in all of the Old Testament. I suppose I don't need a rabbi to say that to us, nor is that inspired. It comes to us, you're holding in your hand the, the word of God. If you didn't bring a Bible, under every other pew is a Bible, and I think it's page 745. We want you to follow along in chapter 7. So turn there. This chapter runs from the time of Daniel all the way to the return of Jesus Christ. It is a masterpiece. It is a, I hate to call it a literary masterpiece because it's the very breath of God, but it is a masterpiece, a literary masterpiece written by Daniel, given to him in a vision. And Daniel shows the history of the world all the way to the final goal, which will be the judgment of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and his establishment of the kingdom of God. Baldwin, the great commentator, said that once convinced of the truth in Daniel 7, the reader is in possession to the key of history. And I end of quote, I think that's true. If you get Daniel 7, you'll see the links all over the word of God to this very chapter. You know, it's interesting that, you know, we're in a prophetic section. Daniel's detailing, at least to him looking back, some past history with the fall of Babylon. We know that. But then he's going forward to what he couldn't see, declaring the kingdoms that would come after that. And so we're looking at prophetic language. In fact, just to remind you, far from saying we're not quite sure how prophecy turns out, prophecy is 27% of the Bible. <laughs> and see, that baby knows it well, right? It's 27%. And so about half of that has already been fulfilled and there's half to come. And so we want to look at these things. Now we've put that map out there in our outline for you. And we come to the third assurance today. We looked at the first powerful assurance. Go to that next slide of the revealing of God's prophetic will over all human kingdoms of the world. Seven, all these beasts, four of them in particular, were coming up out of the sea. And he said in succession, this is what will happen and all of it happened in prophecy. And we saw that and you can listen to the tape. We've spent a couple weeks on the second powerful assurance, the revealing of God as a judge, both in the ancient of days and the son of man over the final history of the world. And then we left off at the coronation of the son of man where he will be given a kingdom. It says that right there in in verse 14, look at it. To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one sh that shall never be destroyed. And so this, these are assurances of God's sovereignty over the nations and the coming of the kingdom of Christ that should give us hope rather than fear. And we come this day, and I think we could do it in one day. The third assurance is the revealing of God's power. I feel like we're seeing the attributes come out. In the first assurance, it's his prophetic voice or his will over the kingdoms. In the second assurance, it's the revealing of God as judge and the coronation of the Son of Man. But as we come to this third one, it's the revealing of God's power over the Antichrist, which we will address today, and the coming of the kingdom of God and the coming of the Son of Man. That's enough for review. Let's go, okay? What Daniel gives us here in 15 through 28 is really a chronology 
of when this will happen. And I'm going to stay very close to the text this morning. I'm laughing because every week I'm going to stay close to the text. You could either ignore prophecy altogether or you could become so fanciful with it that they're seeing things that aren't clearly in the text. For example, the name of the Antichrist. Would you like me to name him today? See that, if, you, if I said I'm going to name him, it'd be like, ooh. And I've, I've got a list of about 15 people who were named the Antichrist. I think the last one was Barack Obama. And every single time there's, there's wars and all these things, we begin to name people. I'm not going to do that. Because I don't think that's the focus of the writer. And he's pushing us to a future that will become revealed. So I'm going to stay close to the text. But I'm also going to be directing you to the future prophecy in the New Testament. Some by Paul, but certainly others, many of them, by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. I want scripture to interpret scripture for you. And so let's dive in together, okay? Let's be noble Bereans together. Uh, You know, not everybody is going to see the sequence depending on how you were raised and what your background is. But let me unveil for you the exposition of the book of Daniel and you follow along and we'll just keep our Bibles open. We'll become and be noble Bereans. So let's pick up the text. Let's go. I'm going to read it as we move through it. There in verse 15, Daniel says, as for me, Daniel... He's speaking there. My spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. I mean, what a great conclusion in verse 14. But his spirit is anxious. Why? Because of the visions of my head. And when he's seen this vision, all in chapter 7, it alarmed him. Look at verse 16. So I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. This is incredible. He has this vision And we we looked at that in 1 through 8. And then he says in verse 16 that there was one standing there and I asked him the exact truth or the, if I could have the truth concerning this and he made it all known to him. So far from not knowing about these visions, the angel interpreted the vision now, you, you, you're saying with me, as you look at verse 16, one of those who stood there, who was that? Well, I think it's fair to say that it was an angel. And I say because in this vision, if you look back at verse 10, where it says, a, and I'm in chapter 7, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him. Serving the ancient of days was these angels. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. And the court said in judgment and the books were opened. Certainly in 710, it is the angels, okay? There with the ancient of days. The Bible often has angels interpreting visions. If you want to look later in Daniel 921... Look in Daniel 10.10, look in Zechariah 1.9, Zechariah 2.3, Revelation 17.7. This is very common prophetic language. He sees this vision and he's asking one who's standing by what it means. It's an angel. It is entirely possible that this angel was the angel Gabriel. You say, why do I say that? Just turn one page to Daniel chapter 8 and in verse 16. Actually, in verse 15, when I, Daniel, 
8.15, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of the man, and I heard the man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called Gabriel. Make this man understand the vision. And you can see the same thing in Daniel 9.21. It's an angel Likely it is Gabriel in chapter 7. He spoke with him in chapter 8. He spoke with him in chapter 9. I could go weeks on that, but let's keep going. What did the angel say? Look at verse 17. It says there, these four great beasts. Now, we've looked at this a little bit before. Are four kings, four beasts, four kings, who shall arise out of the earth. Now, we know that from Daniel 7. Successively, they were Babylon, they were Medo-Persia, they were Greece, and the last king that came up, or kingdom, was what? Was Rome. But often in prophecy, often, there is both a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. Because he sees four kings, four kingdoms come up, But look at the text again in 7.18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. It's, he looks back again to the end of the world where the Son of Man comes up and he's given a kingdom there. And that kingdom, in verse 14, he will rule forever and ever and ever. And we just read that, you know, just right back just a few minutes ago. Now, it's interesting. Look at the language again there in verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the what? The kingdom. And I went to some length that, of course, there's an eternal state, Revelation 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth. But we took some time in Revelation 20 that six different times there it spoke of a thousand year reign of Christ. And I find it interesting, I don't want to push it too far here, that the saints are receiving the kingdom and possessing the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Phase one is thousand years. Phase two is the eternal state. I I just think it's interesting that he didn't say they go straight to heaven. The saints are receiving a kingdom from the Lord. Look down in chapter seven at verse 22. Until the ancient of days, he's going to that future scene again, came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. We take that as an earthly, physical, bodily reign at the end of the world. Glance down in chapter 7 in verse 27. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall give, be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, and his kingdom shall be an everlasting dominion, and all dominions shall serve him in that reign, the thought is, and obey him. And so here it's interesting. Here is these four great beasts. Here is these four kings, if you will, in 17. They're arising out of the earth, but in verse 18, he gives the kingdom, obviously, to the Son of Man, but the Son of Man shares that with us. Now, we've seen that. We've looked at that. But the thing you got to know about Daniel, this guy's curious. (laughs) I mean, this is, if, if somebody's a Bible teacher, what marks someone that way is they're curious. They have a fascination to know, and so they want the people they teach to know. And Daniel wants to know, and he wants to know more. You say, how do you know that? Look at the text in verse 19. It says, then, he's he's just walking us through this vision. I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, 
which was different from all the rest. Why? Exceedingly terrifying, with teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. Now, obviously, this is corresponding. Glance back at 7-7. I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying, dreadful, exceedingly strong, and it had iron teeth and devoured, and it broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts before it, and it had ten horns. And so he's looking back, and he wants to know more, beloved. Far from saying I don't want to know prophecy. The writers of the language of scripture through the very breath of God by the inspiration of the spirit wants you to know something. And here he wants to know more about that fourth beast. Now the language was, you saw it there in 719, it's different from all the rest. It was exceedingly terrifying. I mean, Verse 15, no wonder he was alarmed. I mean, it's just terrifying. It possessed, if you will, if you can picture that, and I didn't want to put any pictures up. It had iron teeth. It's interesting that in 719, not added in 77, it had claws of bronze. You're talking about a beast that could tear a victim to shreds and then stomp on them. And so he begins to go back in flashback mode. Look at verse 20. Look at it there. And about the 10 horns that were on its head. Now watch this. And another horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things. And that seemed greater than its companions. Wow. He sees after this fourth beast, then 10 horns come up on the head. Then another horn, if you will, comes up. As it comes up, three of the 10 fall away. What's interesting about this beast, it's put in human language. It had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and it seemed greater than its companions. He's pushing something else. What else is he pushing? Look, in verse 21, here's the text. Here's what he's adding. It says there in 21, and as I looked, he's just, he's curious. This horn made war with the saints and it prevailed over them. He makes war and he's winning and he's prevailing it's quite a, a statement there. You say, well, how long? Praise the Lord, not forever. Look at the text again in 722, praise God. Until, until the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the most high. What do you mean judgment? In other words, when he comes, the ancient of days, when the son of man comes at the second coming, it was judgment was given for the saints. In other words, he's going to stamp out evil and exonerate the saints. And it says there, and the time came when the saints, there it is again in 22, possessed the kingdom. And so he's moving back and forth explaining as he goes. You say, well, what happened? Well, look again at 23. Here's the future aspect. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, and who's this? Who's the he? The, it's angel. It's the angel. It's probably Gabriel. As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. He's, he's restating it. And it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it into pieces. Now look at the beginning of 24. 
as for the ten horns, remember, after the fourth beast, out of this kingdom, in other words, he's, he's pushing it beyond Rome, ten kings shall arise, and in verse 24, and another shall arise. This fourth kingdom, as often in prophecy, has two periods of existence. One is in history, certainly that would have been ancient Rome, and one in the future, which I've deemed, I believe, a revived Rome at the end of the world. And some Bible teachers have attempted to find these 10 kings in past history. They've looked at the Grecian Empire, and then they later looked at Rome. But there's such disagreement, they demonstrate the difficulty of explaining this verse as past history. Listen, if the 10 kings are in power at the end of the age, and they are, then we believe that when you get to 23 and 24 here, he's talking about something in the future. In fact, go, I think it's the next slide in the book of Revelation as we begin to compare Scripture with Scripture. It's interesting in Revelation 13, which we take as prophetic, the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty, it says, and blasphemous words. But there's one I missed in there. If you look on your own, it's in Revelation 13, 1. It says, I saw the beast rising out of the sea and it had 10 horns. So what's spoken of in Daniel 7 is spoken of in Revelation 13, 1, where this beast is coming up out of the sea, it says there. It also says in Revelation 17, 12, that the 10 horns are 10 kings, and it even says there, who have not received their royal power. So we believe here it's still in the future. There was a fourth beast in Rome in history, but there's coming a future revived empire that will come on the scene. And as it comes on the scene, it comes on with 10 horns. Now, you, you say, I think I alluded to that. Some people say, well, that's just prophetic language. We don't take that as prophetic language. At the end of the world, within the Eastern European common market, we believe there's going to be 10 kings. You say, well, Scott, there could be 11 now. There could be 18. That's okay. At the end, there's going to be 10. There's going to be 10. And then arising out of that becomes another one. Look at verse 24. It says, another shall arise, middle of 24, after them, and he shall be different from the former ones. And then again it says, he shall put down three kings. This is future. I think it's interesting that in the earlier text, in Daniel 7, 8, it's called a little horn. But here, when you get to verse 24, it says that it's just another shall arise after him. And he is going to make war with the saints. Beloved, this is the end of the world. It's Sinclair Ferguson said, the little horn represents the final consummation of evil. And Sinclair Ferguson said, it belongs to the final day. Now, who is this little horn and then another one that will arise? We understand his name in the New Testament to be what? The Antichrist. I can give you a bunch of names, not of our own day, but names in the scripture. In Daniel 8, 23, he's called the king with a, a bold face. Or in the NASB, the king of a fierce countenance. In the book of Daniel, the Antichrist is called the prince who shall come. In the book of Daniel in eleven thirty six, he's called a willful king. 
We meet him again described, this little horn, this other horn that rises in the New Testament. He's called the abomination of what? Desolation. This is not something that happened in 70 AD. We believe that in the second coming of Christ, this Antichrist is going to uh, have sway, if you will, for seven years. In the middle of that time, I'll show you this in the weeks to come and a little today, he's going to break a pact that he makes with Israel. And then he's going to make war with the saints. But when you see, Jesus said, the abomination of desolation, you better run, is what he says. In Revelation 13, the Antichrist is called the beast. I suppose here in Daniel 7, he's a beast. In 1 John chapter 2, in verse 1, he is called the Antichrist. He is, beloved, Antichrist. Whatever we just sang, show us Christ. There will come out of the abyss a man called the Antichrist who will challenge every single thing that comes out of the word of God. He will challenge every single thing that his word says because he's Antichrist. It's a frightening thought in some ways. John the apostle writes that the spirit of the Antichrist in 1 John 4, 3, is already in the world. I mean, that's just true. His spirit, the challenging of Christ, the anti-Christ, the spirit of that is already in the world, 1 John 4, 3. Paul said, when he's talking about the anti-Christ, that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, okay, but the Antichrist full attack still lies in the future. And we're going to see this in chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 11, and chapter 12. And I just want you to know, I'm not talking about a movie here. I'm not talking about what's brought up and in, in generated by computers. We're talking about a person he is a man whose soul will come out of the abyss. He is a demon, if you will, in a human body. He is marked, at least here, not the whole Bible, by five characteristics. You say, well, why are you telling me about him? Because Daniel did, right? I'm not trying to sensationalize. In fact, if anything, I'm actually being pretty quiet compared to how some human authors write. You say, well, what is he like? Well, he's, it's told what he's like. He's marked at least here by five characteristics, okay? Five characteristics. First, he's going to be marked by deceptive politics. He will be marked by deceptive politics. You say, well, in what way? But look back at chapter 7 and verse 8. It's interesting there where it says... It says another horn, verse 8, a little one, before which the three of the first horns, this is the phrase, were plucked up by the roots. It's interesting, plucked up. The idea that these three kings, they're not destroyed, it's not violent. The idea is that they're pushed out. They're pushed out by, in the Aramaic, by a gradual replacement. It's not violent. In other words, this individual is subtle in some ways, at least at the beginning, in his political diplomacy. He pushes others out. It's interesting in Revelation 6 that the one who comes is riding on a horse with a bow. But what's absent there, at least in Revelation 6, is there's no arrows. In other words, this guy that's coming is going to be marked by deceptive politics. He accomplishes at the beginning what he needs to without a hostile takeover, okay? He conquers without fighting. In fact, Look over in Daniel 11, in 36, 
there's another passage about this very person. It says in Daniel eleven thirty six and another, and the king shall do as he wills. Speaking of the Antichrist in eleven thirty six, he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. It says he shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished for that which is decreed is done. But if you will look back at 1121 there, it says in his place shall arise a contemptible person of whom the royal majesty has not yet been given. He shall come in without warning, and here's the phrase, and obtain the kingdom by what? Flatteries. He's going to flatter. He's going to be deceptive politically. And I wrote in my notes, he's going to be a deceptive political genius. He will be highly intelligent. He will manifest great leadership ability. He, if you can believe it, will make peace in the Middle East, in Daniel chapter 9. Even at the beginning in Daniel 9, Israel will love him. He's called in Daniel chapter 8 a, a solver of riddles. He will even help the Jews rebuild the temple. But he's going to be marked by deceptive politics. So Daniel looks at Rome, but he goes past Rome and he begins to describe in that seven year time of the great tribulation, this figure called the Antichrist. But there's a second characteristic is not only is he marked by deceptive politics, but secondly, he will be marked by decadent pride. He's going to be marked by pride. Say, how so? Well, look at the text in 720. And about the ten horns were on his head, and the other horn came up before which the three of them fell. And the horn that had eyes, here it is, and a mouth that spoke great things. He is just pompous. He is arrogant. He is speaking words of great things. Look back in your Bible. It's right there in the same chapter in verse 8, where it says at the end of verse 8, it says, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, highly intelligent, and a mouth, there it is again, speaking what? Great things. And so this is, just, this, is this man. He is just a guy that opens his mouth. Look down at verse 25 again of chapter 7. He shall speak words, and here's the anti, against the most high. That's a phrase for God. So he's anti-God. He's anti-Christ. And it says in verse 25, he shall wear out the saints of the most high. Okay? He possesses not only deceptive, if you will, in politics, but he will move people and persuade millions by his sheer voice, if you will, and his words. He will possess great oratorical ability. It's interesting, as I believe it will come up on the screen, when you look to the future in the New Testament, the beast... That's another name for him. It says in 13.5, was given a mouth uttering haughty, there it is, and blasphemous words, and it was allowed, by who? By God, to exercise authority for 42 months. That's three and a half years. Look, at, look again, it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in the earth. This guy's gonna just come on the scene and his weapon is going to be words. Words. 
It shows does this pride in 2 Thessalonians when Paul talks about him in chapter 2 and verse 3 and 4 that the day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and here's another name, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, okay? He's called the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be what? God. Now, listen, Maybe I'll just throw this footnote in here. If you're post-mill, you're thinking all of this was fulfilled at 70 AD. I've not seen that guy yet. This is still in the future. In fact, beloved, from Daniel to the Apostle John to the Apostle Paul, they're all describing that same beast In fact, now look over at chapter 11 in Daniel. It's just another sighting of who he is and even here his decadent pride. And it's in verse 37. He, Daniel 11, 37, shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other God, for he shall magnify himself, what? Above all. So here he is, deceptive in his politics, decadent in his pride. Thirdly, and I've mentioned it, but he will be marked by dreadful persecution. Dreadful persecution. Look at verse 21. It said that he, this horn was little and ate, but now he's the horn. He made war. He persecuted the saints and he prevailed over them. Look down at verse 25. It says there that um, he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear down the saints of the Most High. It's interesting The ideal of wear down, at least in Aramaic and its Hebrew equivalent, is the idea of wearing down a garment. Or maybe you wear down a shoe or you wear down a sandal. And the thought here, at least in this Antichrist, is he's not talking about a violent attack But he's talking about, in that time frame, a continual persecution that wears down a believer so that the believer is just utterly exhausted. He will wear them down like we might wear out clothes. He will harass them so that they cannot breathe. Now listen, all I'll tell you is you could look in Zechariah He will do away, this is not just wearing down, with two-thirds of the Jewish people. Zechariah 13, 7 and 8. He will, according to Zechariah 14, conquer the city of Jerusalem. Put that in your heart and mind. He will, according to Revelation 13, slaughter a multitude of Gentiles in Revelation 13, 7 through 10. It says in Daniel 7, 23, he will devour the whole earth. It says in Revelation 11, 7, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that arises from the bottomless pit will make war on them in 11, 7 and conquer them and kill them. I'm just reading you the Bible, okay? Revelation 13, 7 says it was allowed, allowed sovereignty of God to make war on the saints. And who are these saints? These saints that he wars against are the Jewish people that have become believers and the multitude of Gentiles who have become believers and who were saved in the tribulation. You say, well, pastor, how does he just persecute these believers? Well, I, it will look in weeks to come, but certainly through injustice, 
Certain, certainly through the seizure of property, certainly through the control of buying and selling. You say, well, pastor, how do you know that? Revelation 13, 16, and 17. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be marked on the right hand of the, or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast. This is what Daniel is saying. No wonder he was alarmed, okay? In, in fact, look at verse 25, again, as we pursue that point. Watch this, and I'll be brief. He shall speak words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. He shall think, watch this, to change the times and the law, okay? Make alterations in times of law. Some, you know, projecting, what does this mean? That he will try to rid the seven-day week and change it to a 10-day week like Napoleon did during the French Revolution. But I think here, when he seeks to change, as it says, there are the times and the law, I think he's going to choose when people can worship and when they can't worship. Just like we saw, I think, in a small way at COVID. It's okay for bars to be open, but believers can't gather. And I think in your heart of hearts, we're watching our freedom leave the building, aren't we? More and more and more and more control to the point now where I'm probably old school. You just have to tap your credit card on some machine. Beep, and there you go. He's going to control buying and selling. And what's so insidious, wicked, wicked here is that God is the one in Daniel 2.21 who determines times and seasons. But this guy in his heart of hearts is so anti-God and anti-Christ that he thinks he's going to do that. So there's decadent politics, there's, there, excuse me, deceptive politics, decadent pride, dreadful persecution, fourth, demonic power. I mean, you're asking, who gives this guy this kind of power? Here I'm alluding to Revelation 13. I, I think I got it right here on the PowerPoint where he saw the beast rising out of the sea with the 10 horns and the 10 heads and the 10 diadems on the horns the beast I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, you can read it. To it, at the end, the who? The dragon. The dragon in the New Testament is Satan. So we're not talking Satan right up to this point. We were talking Antichrist. Who gives Antichrist the power? And to it the beast rising out of the sea, the dragon, Satan, gave his power and his throne and he gave him great authority. This is what the end's gonna look like. In Revelation 13, in verse three through five, the Antichrist, it says one of its, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but the mortal wound was healed and it says there, the whole earth marveled. Something's going to happen. He's going to take a hit to the head. I think it's going to be fake. And he's going to go down. It's going to be mortal, okay? As it says there, and the whole earth marveled and followed the beast. And they worshipped, here it is again, the dragon. Because that's what Satan was about from the very beginning. He wanted the preeminence. He wanted to be more important than God. He was the one who was the shining star, as he said in Isaiah. And he quickly fell out of heaven. Here he is coming out at the end of the world inside this person. And it says there that they worshipped the dragon for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? And it was allowed, I take that by God, 
It was allowed, it says there, to give breath to the image of the beast so that it, the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those slain or cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. I, I mean, you just look there. That's why when JFK, this, this happens, I'm, I'm not saying anything there. He took a mortal wound to the head and many thought that he would get up and speak again. And we know that he didn't. But if he did, would you have listened to him? And, and down this stuff goes. And then people said, well, Hitler killed himself. And they get all fanciful. All I know is whoever this person is, okay, he's going to take a wound and then he's going to be raised, okay? You say, well, ah, oh, Scott, this is hard to hear. Yeah, it is. Imagine my week living with this. Hey, pray for me. Not easy for me to get up here and I have no idea why. It's, it's not that I don't believe the truth, but I gotta walk with this stuff and be faithful to God vertically so I could declare this to you. You say, how long will it go on? Look at the text again in verse 25. It says, and they shall be given into his hand, and you've seen this before, a time, that is a year earlier in Daniel 4, times, that's two years, if a time is one year, and a half a time, okay? Three and a half years. And I just say, uh, I'm thankful for that. It doesn't go on. This is the time of the great tribulation in the book of Matthew 21, excuse me, 24, 21. It goes seven years, it says there. And at the three and a half year mark, of course, he makes the pack. It's interesting, look on the screen in Revelation 11, two and three, and I'll try to be brief here. They will trample the holy city in Revelation 11, two and three for 42 months. Now, I just, we take that literally. And it says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses, that's the context, and they will prophesy for 1260 days. That's three and a half years. It says in the book of Revelation in 12, six, the woman fled into the wilderness. We believe that's Israel, saved Israel, where, that got saved, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. So this demonic power, praise God, is on a leash, is on a leash. In fact, there's mercy in the days listed. Because it says in Matthew 24, there will be a great tribulation. I don't think he's talking about 70 AD here. There will be a great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, and nor will ever be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, the days were cut short. Praise the Lord. Ferguson, he said conflicts, some of you know why I'm quoting <laughs> Ferguson. I like Ferguson. But he says conflicts are inevitable till the end. And he said rather than decrease, it will be perched perpetuated until it reaches its zenith in the ferocious blasphemies of the little horn. And so listen, he's going to bring global peace at the beginning. He's going to solve riddles in the Middle East. He's going to be politically savvy. He's going to be intellectually brilliant. He will probably even in that sense on the backside become a military genius because he is demonically inspired by the dragon himself who even can make signs appear in the sky. But this is not the end though. Let me Oh, well, thank you. This, this, and by the way, I, maybe I shouldn't throw this out, but I think I will. I teach a pre-trib rapture. If you're in Christ, you're not here during this time. And we'll get into that in Daniel 9. But this, I got to get out, is he will be marked and be demonstrably 
pulverized. Praise God, right? I, I'm just, I, I should have gave more time to this, but look, it says in 26, but... Thank you, Daniel. The court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion, the Antichrist, shall be, what does it say, taken away, just like Nebuchadnezzar's was, just like Medo-Persian's kingdom was, just as Greece was in Rome. He's going to be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. Praise the Lord. Look back at 7-11, didn't it say the same thing? I looked because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed. It's the Antichrist. And its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. I praise the Lord for that. It says in Revelation 19-20, that these two were thrown in alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And then look at the end at 27. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts... He says it again, greatly alarmed me. Why do you think? I, I, I'm not even quite sure. He said, my color changed. I turned pale. And when I say I'm not sure, is he's writing under the inspiration. Maybe it was just the future of his own people. Because I'm thinking he finished on a high note in 26 and 27. But he's greatly alarmed. Talk about that at Grace Groups. And my color changed. He said, but I kept the matter in my heart. Beloved, here's the message. It's not harsh. It's hopeful, okay? God reigns, amen? God is in total control of all history looking back. And he's in control of all history looking forward. And I just want you to know, bottom line, end of the day, if you get this, you get the sermon, okay? You can trust him. If this is exactly what happened in history, why won't it be just like it's described? Listen, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Our God is going to be victorious over every single kingdom and establish his kingdom, which is forever. Amen?